and connect our faith to it so that it profits in those that hear it. How many understanding that? So I want to talk about what did God say specifically on that visitation when, my, when I was walking with my dogs. He said to me, I'm going to bring a move of my spirit and there will be great hostility and violence that will arise upon the earth because the enemy will try to counter what I'm bringing by the way of my glory. How many know Mark 4? Jesus, who carried the glory, spoke and declared in verse 35, let us go to the other side. Immediately there was a great storm that arose and the waves began to arise to try to thwart or counter the glory that was coming. In Mark 6, the disciples are in the boat and Jesus begins to walk out on the water. And the Bible says in Mark 6, you can look it up, that, they, that Jesus had intended on purpose to pass them by. As Jesus is walking out on the waters, the disciples mistake Jesus and begin to think that he is a ghost. Let me encourage you and those that are watching. There are some people, like our opening text, that are getting out of faith. They're allowing their conscience to become full of unbelief. Some are having shipwreck because what they're doing is, like the disciples, when they saw Jesus coming, they misread the signs. They called what God is doing or his visitation associating it with evil. Some are doing that with this president. Some are doing that with this administration. They are unable to correctly see that there is something of God that is trying to move and bring and align this nation for something glorious, but they're calling it evil, or they refuse to acknowledge what God is doing. Are you listening? So the Lord said violence would increase, but then he said this. He said, I'm going to bring revival. Now here's the first point. He said, if you're going to have revival, you must have the agreement of what the prophets foretold. How many know Lester Summerall, Smith Wigglesworth prophesied, said that there would come a last day's move that would be the Word and the Spirit. And God said to me in that visitation, He said, where is my Spirit in some people's churches? When coffee and our coffee centers is what's drawing people to our churches, we need the Spirit of God. If that's our featured product, we need a revival. And in John 13, all the way up until the time that Jesus went to the Garden of Gethsemane, think about this. He was on his way to die. So the words, the last words of a dying man would be probably his most important words, would you agree? And yet, the disciples couldn't hear what Jesus was saying because they were so concerned about greatness. Too many people are concerned about their own personal greatness that they have forgot an important element if we're going to have revival. And that is, we must have the Holy Spirit. And that was his message. Come on, John 14, John 15, John 16. The Comforter shall come. The spirit of truth will come. And the disciples couldn't hear it. They couldn't receive it. And yet that was his message before he was to go to the cross was the Holy Spirit. Now here's the thing. Today we have operating in the earth what happened back in the days with David. This is very prophetic, this tent that has been erected. Because in 1 Chronicles chapter 15 verse 1, the Bible says that David pitched a tent for the presence of God. He did exactly what we're doing. He made room for the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says he did it under a tent, and he did it on a mountain, and it was Mount Zion. It was a little tent, and there was freedom to worship, just like here. There was the tabernacle of David. Amos 9 verse 11 says in the last days that God shall restore the tabernacle of David. That's what we're seeing. But you know, six miles away, come on, how much is the social distancing number? People have social distanced themselves completely away from the Holy Spirit and His move today. They've separated themselves. They put all kinds of nice programs 
religious traditions, and they put a space between them and the ark, the presence of God. So you had the ark of David, the tabernacle of David, the ark of the covenant, the Holy Spirit, the presence of God was there six miles away. You can read this in 1 Chronicles chapter uh, 21. In a place of Mount Gibeon was the tabernacle of Moses, and they were still dressing up the priests in their garments and going through the rituals, just like some are in the church today. But are you ready? I don't even like to say it. There was no Holy Spirit. How important is the Holy Spirit to our revival? We must have the Word, and then we must have the demonstrations of the Spirit to go with it. Thank God this is a place that has both. Come on, give Jesus a shout. The second thing that the Lord said is there is too much fear. Too much fear. Now I want to show you a prophecy. This one speaks of a new era. In 2015, God began to prophesy and he said these words. He said, and here's the prophecy. Is it up on the screen? Just wave if you can see it. The Lord says, in the times that are about to be upon you, America, I will give you visible signs by the hand of the Lord Most High. There shall be a former president that will die, will be laid to rest. And this will be a sign of what? An end of an era. In other words, time is going to shift. An end of a thing. And God says, do not be afraid when you see at that same time a shaking that will come by the way of the soil. Three years later, George Sr., Bush Sr., died. And on the same day that he died, there was a 7.0 earthquake in Alaska. Because God's trying to say, don't be afraid. We are in a new era. Now, show this one from last year. This was uh, September 5th, 2019. Now, how many of you remember when Jesus said these words? As in the days of Noah, he was speaking a prophetic word about an historical event, a literal event that took place the days of Noah. But he spoke that because he was giving a prophetic application to get them to understand what God's prophetic agenda is. So you're going to see this prophecy and God reference in this prophecy from 2019, September 5th, God references that there would come, like in the days with Pharaoh and Egypt, that the, the nation would go through plagues. How many of you know we just have seen this? But watch what the promise is. God says you've just not entered into 2020, but you have entered into a decade that shall be known as a decade of difference. What do I mean? Spirit of God says, do you remember when I declared in my word, I'll put a difference, and there should be light in Goshen, but it shall be dark in Egypt. Certain what? Plagues. And things would not touch the place of Goshen because I put a difference. God was getting us ready. Now watch. I speak this to you, those who have fallen in a place of despair and fear. What you shall enter into in this new decade, it will start off how? Harsh. So God already said this. But it shall come to a place known as what? Rest. And it shall be different. Give Jesus a shout. And he prophesied that it would be the decade of difference. Now, why is this important? Turn to Luke 21, verse 26. Jesus is speaking in the prior verse in verse 25. That there'll be signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars. But then he says something very important in verse 26. He says, men's hearts shall fail them for fear because, watch this, they will look after or they will look at. The reason why some are not holding to faith, a good conscience, and they're making shipwreck in their faith is because they're spending too much time looking at the news. And they're getting their perspective from the news. That's why they're angry all the time at the president. That's why they can't see that God could raise and do something with this man. Or like the prophecy said, that there just might be healing in this administration and those that God's aligned that can really actually heal this land. So Jesus said, they're looking after the things that are coming on the earth. Now watch the answer, verse 28. Jesus said, look up, for your redemption draws near or close. Notice he went from looking at and getting an unbelief. Looking at and getting in fear. Looking at and getting the wrong perspective. But notice the answer in verse 28. Look up. Someone say, look up. Come on, shout it. Look up. Come on, we, we 
people of faith. We don't look at, we look up. He said, your redemption draws near. Now, always remember this. When you, when you hear prophecy, when someone even gives a warning, always remember, as long as God's spirit remains in the earth, God will always have a good plan for man and a redemptive plan. That is a plan of help and it's a plan of hope. A redemption. Let's go to Mark 8 very quickly. Jesus wants to adjust our perspective. And the reason he wants to adjust our perspective is because too many are looking at. In Mark chapter 8, look at verse uh, 23. Jesus takes the blind man by the hand and he leads the man, watch this, outside the village. Now why did Jesus take the man by the hand and lead him out of the village? The reason he did that is because he was blind. He did not want the man's perspective when his eyes would be open from blindness. That's why Jesus came, Luke 4, to bring a recovery of sight to the blind. That's what some folk need right now. You've been blinded by the news stations. You've been blinded by the things that you're looking at. He takes them out of the village because who built the villages? Man. He did not want them to have man's perspective. He didn't want them looking at what man built. So he takes them out into the open. Come on. Takes them out in the open. And when he spit on the man's eyes and put his hands on him, he said, do you see anything? People ask me, well, what's the Lord saying? Here's what God's saying. I speak this to you that are watching. The Son of God, the Lord of the church, is saying exactly what he said to this blind man. Church, what do you see? Do you see just violence? Do you see anarchy? Or do you see a redemptive plan of God that is coming over this nation? So he, he anoints him. And he said, he looked up. Notice he didn't look at, he looked up. And notice when his eyes were open, he began to see God's perspective. When you look up, you get God's perspective. When you look at, you'll get an unbelief. You get in fear. Your perspective will get wrong. So he looks up and he begins to see men walking around like trees. What is that? Are you ready? When you're looking up and all the stuff that's happening because you're not looking at it, I keep looking up and here's what it, what it is. I look up and I see men walking like trees. In other words, I see a move of God among men. That's why they were walking. It, it's movement. There is a move of God coming among men. When you look up in faith, you see it. Notice what Jesus did. Verse 35, after this, he put his hands upon him again. Notice what he did. He made him look up. He's making us look up. So we get his perspective. And he restored his sight. And he saw every man more clearly. You know what the answer to racial tension and division? is that we can get folk to look up and get God's heart and God's perspective and just quit looking at stuff that's happening in the earth. The second thing God said, or the first thing was Holy Spirit, second thing, too much fear. Third thing was promote the good. Now I want to read these, scripture, th these prophecies because when you look at the news, if you're looking at it, you see anarchy. How many of you see anarchy? I want to show you prophecies of what the Lord said about anarchy. So you can do the third point. The third point that God said when I was walking my dogs after he said, we need the Holy Spirit for our revival. Number two, too much fear, get his perspective. Number three, promote the good. Promote the good. Look at what God said about anarchy. This one is from July 18, 2017. The Spirit of the Lord says, the spirit of anarchy has sought to whisper in the ears of many within this land and within your government. My assault that I'm bringing is to destroy this spirit's work. And when I do, my spirit shall rise out of the midst and suddenly there will be a what? Okay, now this is in 2017. A cleansing of your what? How many of you heard that since the shut-in there's been a cleansing of the air? See, the enemy wants us to get his perspective and look at the anarchy. There'll be a cleansing of your territories. And there shall be a moment as it was that Jacob and Esau were once at war. But there was an embrace. Do you think that this is impossible again? Look at June 14th, 2017. There's a spirit that has been released. A spirit from hell and you call yourself anarchia or anarchy. And you've said we will create great turmoil against this administration. Come on. 
We've seen the collusion. We've seen all the attempts to remove. Have we ever sat back and thought that we're not wrestling against flesh and blood? That the Spirit of God already said that there is a spirit of anarchy which wants to, come on, bring a coup d'etat, an overthrow, establish a spirit of socialism in our nation? God was already speaking it in 2017 to create great turmoil. And this president, and you, spirit of anarchy, you say you'll create just enough where people will believe it, where people will not trust the government, they'll rise up against it. Now watch the promise. This shall what? This shall fail. Look at February 14th, 2018. There shall be outbursts of violence for the things that will be exposed. But this can be stopped, says the Lord. You're not wrestling against flesh and blood. You're wrestling against the spirit of anarchy. A spirit of what? Lawlessness. And a spirit that seeks to what? Divide. And to make you think that it's another issue. Did you hear that? To make you think it's another issue. Then what is at hand? But it is the work of the spirits of darkness. Listen to the secrets I say to you now. Listen to the words so that you may what? You may pray. They said, we shall attack the officers and kill them. This is 2018. This can be stopped, for it shall be the prayers of those who've been anointed as watchmen in the cities that can bring a hedge even around the law enforcement and those that who do not know me. For the Lord says, as you pray, you will see my hand move swiftly. So we're going to keep praying. Now, why is that? Why is that? Because the third thing that God said to me on that day Walking my German shepherds, promote the good. Why promote the good? Because anyone can get up and speak unbelief. Anyone can get up and declare doom and gloom. But Jesus taught us in Luke 4, 18. It takes an anointing to declare good things, good news. Jesus walked in as one big bad self. He said, look at me. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And he has anointed me to preach doom and gloom. That's not what he said. He said, look at me. I'm anointed to preach good news. Acts 10, 38. How Jesus was anointed with the Holy Ghost who went about doing good and healing all, not some, who are oppressed of the devil. Why do we need to promote the good? Here's why. Matthew 24. If you ask people, what are some of the birth pains? What are some of the signs of the time? You'll always hear people say, earthquakes in various places, wars and rumors of wars, and they'll go down, nations against nation, correct? But why do we forget verse 14? It says this gospel, what's the gospel? Good news. This gospel shall be preached or promoted. Come on. This good news, promote the good, this good, shall be preached or promoted as a witness. What's the witness? Signs, wonders, and miracles. Because I'm gonna show you why promote the good, because the goodness of God and His glory always go together. Okay, I'm gonna prove it to you, okay? But notice what it says in Matthew 24, 14, the last part of that verse, as a witness, and then the what? The end shall come. But look at Exodus 33, verses 18 and 19. Why do we promote the good? We don't just look at anarchy that's trying to arise. We have to, as people of faith, faith for freedom, we have to understand as we promote the good that we are actually like a human mag magnet, drawing God himself into our lives, our city, our streets, and our nation. There's something about when you proclaim God who is a good God and you say it. I used, oh, man, I used to listen so much and still do to Sister Gloria about Jesus healing them all. God's a good God. I can hear her saying it now. Think about this. Why promote the good? Exodus 33, 18. Moses is talking with God, and he says these words. Are you ready? He says, please, Lord, show me your glory. Show me your glory. Notice what is this request. Show me your glory. Show, man, I feel that glory is moving out from this place. I can feel it. Show me your glory. Now watch what God's first response is. Why promote the good? Because Jesus said it. The anointing is upon me. Come on. That presence to preach good. Goodness and glory go together. Watch the next thing. 
God says, I will make all my goodness pass before you. Notice the connection. Goodness and glory. Now let's go to 2 Chronicles chapter 5, verse 13. Watch this connection. So when the trumpeters were as one, and the singers and the musicians were as one, to make one sound in their praising and their thanking the Lord, and when they lifted up their voice and the cymbals, notice what they were saying, verse 14. Remember, promote the good. Why? Goodness and glory go together. They said, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. That the house, or you could say then the house. So something happened as a magnet. They were saying, God, you're good. Your mercy endures forever. What would happen if we would speak words of faith to our president? The Lord is good over Donald Trump and his mercy endures forever. What would happen if we spoke over our nation? The Lord is good over your United States and his mercy endures forever. By the way, whenever I prophesy now, the Lord has put a watch over my mouth. I don't speak and say America. He always said to me, since 2016, you are to declare it as the United States. Because every time you speak it, every time you prophesy it, every time you say it, it is a prophetic act of faith that this nation is uniting as the United States. 